partying too hard, blood kind of dirty, have the toxins got you down, worry not, you're in luck, it's the urinary system. Hello, welcome to my coronavirus classroom. I'm Janessa Jacobs and this is the urinary system. So the urinary system is very, very important to normal homeostasis. It helps with many things. First, it regulates your water balance, making sure that we have the right amount of fluid in the intracellular and extracellular compartment. So that's a big important function, regulate water balance. So, um, and we can do that by either increasing urine output if there's too much water in the body or decreasing urine output if there's not enough water in the body. So we'll say that the kidneys alter urine output according to the body's water needs. So another important function of the kidneys is that they're going to help to regulate your ion balance. They're going to help to regulate your balance of pretty much everything that can be floating around in your blood. So your ions are things like, you know, your minerals, calcium, magnesium, uh, chloride ions, sodium. Sodium is the one that has the biggest impact on the movement of water or osmolarity. Uh, but your kidneys are going to help to balance it all. So your kidneys will we'll say kidneys monitor blood levels of ions and excrete or reabsorb as needed. Your kidneys are also going to be able to help regulate your acid-base balance. Your kidneys all on their own can act as a buffer. Buffers protect against rapid increases or decreases in hydrogen ion concentration. And the blood pH has to be maintained between 7.35 and 7.45 on the pH scale. So your kidneys can uh, all on their own, like if you're too acidic, they can pull out hydrogen ion. So your kidneys act as buffers to protect against pH shifts. So we'll say that that your kidneys act as buffers. Uh, I'll just say to maintain blood pH. Okay, the next thing that your kidneys are going to do is help with the excretion of our liquid wastes. So we said that the digestive system excreted our solid wastes. The urinary system is going to excrete our liquid waste. So this is the removal of liquid waste or all the waste in your blood from the system. So excretion, removal of liquid wastes. From the blood and therefore the system. Kidneys are also pretty cool because they secrete erythropoietin and renin. So if you recall, we said that red blood cells are produced through the process erythropoiesis, which is stimulated in red bone marrow by the hormone erythropoietin. So remember, if there's a drop in blood oxygen or if you get hypoxic or have a low uh, blood red, red blood cell count or something like that, the kidneys will detect that and secrete erythropoietin. So that's one cool function. And then also in response to a drop in blood pressure, they re secrete renin to start the renin angiotensin pathway so that we can get that whole system going. So I'm not going to write all that down again. Uh, it says it right here. They produce renin and erythropoietin. You already learned both of those systems. So test yourself if you need to pause right now. Could you recall everything that happens in the renin angiotensin pathway?
and how the kidneys are involved? Could you recall everything in erythropoietin, like in the pathway that involves erythropoietin, and how the kidneys are involved? You should try. So the kidneys are also involved in that whole pathway that helps with blood calcium homeostasis. Recall when we have a drop in blood calcium, parathyroid hormone is going to be released, and it's going to stimulate effectors to increase blood calcium. Small intestine is an effector that we can increase calcium transporters so we can absorb whatever calcium is going through the small intestine. But there we need calcitriol to act synergistically with parathyroid hormone. And we get calcitriol from calcidiol and we get calcidiol from vitamin D that was activated from, by the sun from the precursor in our skin. Pretty crazy. So well, this is a kidney function though. So if we just recall that the sun hits your skin and activates vitamin D3, and this goes to the liver where we get calcidiol, and then we go to the kidneys and activate that calcidiol into calcitriol, and calcitriol plus parathyroid hormone are going to act at the small intestine to increase calcium absorption. Okay. This is kind of a strange function and you have to be pretty darn starving for the kidneys to do this because the liver does it and the liver does it easily and it does it all the time. Gluconeogenesis. Glucose. New. Making. So gluconeogenesis, recall, is how we make new glucose using non-carbohydrate substrates. And the liver does that primarily. But if you are super, super, super starved and you have been nutrient deprived for a long time, your kidneys can actually help and do some gluconeogenesis as well. So what we could say is here in, during extreme nutrient deprivation, kidneys can assist the liver with gluconeogenesis. And you might say, well, if you're in extreme nutrient deprivation, where is the liver getting the substrates for gluconeogenesis? Where am I getting my non-carbohydrate substrates? And the answer is, if you are in an extreme nutrient deprived situation for a long time, you are stressed out. So you'll have cortisol in high levels in your body as well. And so what does cortisol do? it increases the breakdown of skeletal muscles, right? And so then you can use those proteins to break down and use the amino acids for gluconeogenesis. You could also stimulate lipolysis and then break down and get our non-esterified fatty acids that the liver can use for gluconeogenesis. So the liver is gonna be doing that primarily, but um, it's gonna be like really tapped out. So in, in those extreme nutrient deprivation situations, the kidneys are gonna kick in and assist. Okay, so what are the organs of our urinary system? Well, uh, Alex is going to help me show you in just a minute. We'll just talk about them. They're the kidneys, the ureters, the urinary bladder, and the urethra. So let's just quick have a definition for each and then we'll look at them. Kidneys filter blood and produce urine. Filter blood and produce urine. Ureters conduct urine to the urinary bladder. So these are just tubes that conduct urine away from the kidneys to the urinary bladder. Urinary bladder, temporary storage bag for urine. <laughs> so this is a temporary storage site. And then the urethra is the tube that is going to conduct urine to the external environment. So, 
Those are the organs. Where are they in the body? So the kidneys are retroperitoneal in the abdominal cavity, meaning that they sit outside of the peritoneum. And that's because <clears throat> they don't really need friction reduction. They need to be anchored in the back of your abdominal cavity. And so there's, there are a couple layers of connective tissue that are gonna do that, but we can see here, these are your kidneys. And they sit at the posterior aspect of your abdominal cavity. And what else do I want to say about it? Your adrenal glands are sitting on top of there. These are your renal arteries and veins. We're going to look at the internal structure of the kidney in great detail, the anatomy and all of these pieces. But what you can see here is this outer region is where we're filtering our blood and producing urine that's going to collect in this inner region here. This is the renal pelvis that's going to lead away into the ureters. So the ureters are these tubes here that are going to lead into the urinary bladder. And Alex actually has both male and female genitalia in my race out of the campus on the last day. I only brought the male part, but this is the urinary bladder right here. And so then the male urethra is quite long, much longer than the female urethra. So what we can see here is this is the urinary bladder. And if we pull this open, we can see this inner part here is lined with transitional epithelial tissue. This is a muscle called the detrusor muscle. And then up here we've got serosa. Down here we have adventitia. So adventitia is gonna anchor the inferior and lateral parts into the pelvic cavity, but then there's serosa on top so that we can have some expansion and reduce friction there. And then the urinary bladder is going to lead away into the urethra, which for the male has to, tra has to traverse the entire length of the penis and it's smaller in the female. But so those are the organs of the urinary system. Again, kidneys, ureters, urinary bladder, urethra. And let's talk about all this stuff. <clears throat> okay. All right, so think about the gross anatomy of the kidneys, their location and their external anatomy. Again, they're located back here at the posterior aspect. They're hiding behind your false ribs, 11 and 12. So if we look at them, the supportive tissue that surrounds them is they're sur surrounded in renal fascia, which is just fibrous connective tissue. The perirenal fat pad or the perirenal fat capsule is deep to that. And then the fibrous capsule is this just kind of thin layer of tissue around the outside of the kidney. And so those are all of this kind of kidney uh, supportive tissues. On our models really all, we don't show any of it. <laughs> You could just imagine this would be a really thin layer of fibrous tissue on the outside. That would be the capsule. Um, but what you can see on the model is our internal anatomy structure. So the kidney has an outer renal cortex and an inner renal medulla. So this is the renal cortex out here. This is the renal medulla in here. And then the medulla drains into the pelvis. Now, this is all the tubule system that is gonna conduct urine away from the kidneys. If we were to pop this out of here, there would be open spaces back there. That's the renal sinus. This is the renal, this is the hilum of the kidney, and it contains a root of the kidney. And so then we've got our renal artery and our renal vein that are coming into the kidney at the root, and a ureter that is here as well. So if you look there, the root of the kidney contains a renal artery, a renal vein, and a ureter. Other things just to be aware of then, we plug this back in here, so this is the renal pelvis that is going to drain away into the ureter. And that is, again, draining our renal medulla, which is split into these things called medullary pyramids by renal columns. The renal columns are cortical tissue that splits down into the medulla to form those medullary pyramids. So this like uh, region here, can you guess what it might be called? I'll give you a hint, you've seen them on your tongue. 
You've seen them inside the heart. It's a, a renal papilla. So I think, remember way back in semester one, I told you that if you had things that are shaped like this, we often call them papilla. Well, here's a renal papilla. And each of our renal papilla is going to drain into these little tiny papillary ducts that are going to drain into these things called minor calyces that are going to merge to become a major calyx and all our major calyces merge to become the renal pelvis that drains away into the ureter. So we're going to have to look at all of that stuff and talk about it, but I just wanted to show you while we're looking at the model. So again, this is the outer cortex. So this is cortical tissue. This is where we filter our blood um, to produce our urine that's going to be drained away here in this system. This is the renal medulla split into medullary pyramids. You can see at the end of each pyramid is a renal papilla that's going to drain away into that system. So we'll continue talking about that. That's kind of our gross anatomy. What else? Okay, so when we think about the kidneys, we're talk going to be talking about the movement of two fluids through them, blood, that's being filtered and urine that's being produced as we pull all of the things that we don't want in our blood out. So anything that we have in excess and any wastes. So what's the blood and nerve supply? We're not, I'm not gonna, everything has nerves. Everything has lymphatics. I'm not gonna worry about the nerves or lymphatics. We are gonna worry about the arteries and veins. So your renal artery is going to come into the kidney and branch into these segmental arteries. The segmental arteries are going to branch to interlobar arteries that are between these lobes of the kidneys. The interlobar arteries are going to branch into these arcuate arteries. Arcuate arteries run parallel to the surface of the kidney. So there are my arcuate arteries there. And then off of my arcuate arteries, I can see these teeny tiny things. Those are called either cortical radiate arteries. They're radiating up into the cortical tissue, as you can see, or interlobular arteries. Either way, they both work. What's gonna happen when you get to these little cortical radiate arteries is they're gonna branch into these things called glomeruli. That's where we're gonna filter blood. And so in the glomerulus, we'll filter blood, and then the blood is going to enter our cortical radiate veins that are going to drain into arcuate veins. So here are cortical radiate veins here that drain into arcuate veins, that drain into interlobar veins, that drain into the renal vein. So they don't, we don't have corresponding segmental veins. We just call those, we're gonna go from our interlobar veins right into the renal vein. Okay, so let's think about that. We started our renal artery and it's going to branch into segmental arteries that are going to branch into interlobar arteries. that are going to branch into arcuate arteries. Again, these are the ones that run parallel to the surface of the kidney. The arcuate arteries are going to give rise to, these have two names, either the cortical, they probably have a million names, radiate arteries or interlobular arteries. And then these are draining into the glomerulus. The glomerulus has an afferent arterial. It's going to bring blood into the actual glomerulus. So our afferent arterial is gonna drain into the glomerulus. And this is a tuft of fenestrated capillaries. Then we're gonna drain the glomerulus into an efferent arterial. 
And now this is going to bring the blood into our capillary beds that are going to serve the renal tissue. So we have two types of capillary beds that this blood can then enter. What's called peritubular capillaries that are surrounding the tubule system or vasorecta capillaries that are surrounding these things called juxtamedullary nephron loops. So from the afferent arterial, we'll just for now say that we're going to either enter the peritubular capillaries or the vasa recta, which are also capillaries. This is going to be the site of nutrient and gas exchange for the renal tissue. And from there, we're going to drain away into our little post-capillary venules that are going to ultimately drain into our cortical radiate veins. can also be called interlobular veins that are going to drain into my arcuate veins that are going to drain into my interlobar veins that are going to drain right into my renal veins I don't have corresponding segmental veins Okay, so the companion vessel with my cortical radiate artery is my cortical radiate vein. Companion vessel with my arcuate artery is my arcuate vein. My interlobar veins are going to run along with my interlobar arteries, but then they're draining right into the renal um, veins, whereas my segmental arteries are going to be a slight difference in the arterial pathway. All right. <sighs> What else do we need to worry about? So if the big important job of the kidneys is to filter blood and produce urine, then the workhorse of the kidney is the nephron. It's this tiny microscopic structure that blood is going to come into. There's a lot of pressure created in this area called the glomerulus so that we can filter almost everything out of blood and collect it in this structure that's going to start adjusting what's coming through to take back things that we need and bring them back to the body uh, or to take things out of the body that are in blood that we still want to concentrate in urine. So if we look, we said that as part of the blood flow came through this uh, cortical radiate artery, we would come into this afferent arterial that led into the glomerulus, exit through an efferent arterial that would go to our uh, either peritubular capillaries or our vasorecta capillaries, and then from there continue its way out. Well, in this glomerulus now, this is where we're going to do filtration. So the nephron is the, the workhorse. It's got two parts. This kind of big part here is what we see right here. This is the renal corpuscle. The glomerulus is the fenestrated capillaries in there, and then this is the glomerular capsule. So we're going to push on blood and push almost everything out except for large proteins and cells and collect that filtrate in here. And then that's going to continue into the next part of the nephron, the renal tubule. So the renal corpuscle is this part that has two pieces, the glomerulus and the renal, um, the glomerular capsule, and then the renal uh, tubule, which has three parts, the proximal convoluted tubule, the nephron loop, and the distal convoluted tubule. So that's what we'll talk about right now. So the first part of our nephron is the renal corpuscle, and it has these two parts. So what are all the things we want to say? Nephrons, this is the workhorse of the kidney. They do the job of filtering blood to produce urine. And they are so super cool. Their structure just leads perfectly to their function. So in order to do things like take stuff out of blood and concentrate it in urine to remove it from the system, you have to, have to actively transport against concentration gradients a lot of times. So different parts of the renal tubule are going to have different pumps and things that allow that to happen. And this renal corpuscle is awesome because it is like set up in such a way that we can create a lot of pressure so that we can do filtration.
and it doesn't really cost anything because filtration is a passive process. So how does that happen? The renal corpuscle is the area of the nephron uh, where we're doing what's called glomerular filtration. So this is where we do the filtering of blood. The rest of the nephron is where we're going to produce the urine. Um, so our renal corpuscle, will say, filters blood. And it's got two parts. The, gl the glomerulus, which is that fenestrated tuft of capillaries. and the glomerular capsule. And the glomerular capsule will say this is going to collect filtrate. So the, the, the fluid that we're going to push out of the blood here in the renal corpuscle is not urine and it's not blood plasma. I mean, it looks a lot like blood plasma, but it's not. It's um, now in this tubule system. And so really it's the specific kind of fluid right here called filtrate. And the rate of filtrate production is the most important thing in determining the rate of urine formation. So everything that's going on here is really super important. And if we look here, the glomerular capsule has two parts. This outer part here, <coughs> The parietal layer of the glomerular capsule has these simple squamous epithelial cells that are joined by tight junctions so that urine can't leak out of them. And then it's got this inner visceral layer that hugs around those fenestrated capillaries and those cells are these cells called podocytes. And you can see here they've got these extensions that they're wrapping around. And what that does is gives a little bit of extra protection here in the glomerulus so that we can keep some of our larger proteins and things from getting out of those fenestrations. So I don't know how well you can see it, but it looks textured at least. Those are the pores in the fenestrated capillaries. So what happens, uh, the other cool thing that I can show you here is that the afferent arterial's diameter is larger than the efferent arterial's diameter. So what happens is we bring blood in and it's at higher pressure coming in than it is going out, which means that we're going to create a lot of pressure pressure out in this space. So we can push against all these fenestrations and push out everything except large proteins and cells. And the reason that we're not pushing out large proteins and cells is partly due to these podocytes, they're called, that are wrapping their feet around that fenestrated capillary. So this is the renal corpuscle. The arterioles are the glomerulus. And then the glomerular capsule, or Bowman's capsule, older books tend to call it, has these two parts, the parietal layer that lines, well, the kidney, and then the visceral layer that hugs the, the glomerulus. And then from there, filtrate is going to pass into this next part of the renal tubule, the proximal convoluted tubule. So we will talk more about that in just a minute. So let's just write those things down about our glomerular capsule, that it's got two layers. An inner visceral layer that contains podocytes that wrap around the arterioles. Oh, sorry, that wrap around the glomerulus. These are going to create filtration slits. We'll talk more about that when we actually talk about the process process of glomerular filtration. And they just prevent large materials from entering the filtrate. And if large materials like proteins and things are entering the filtrate and then entering your urine, you know there's a problem in the kidneys. So you can actually tell a lot about the functioning of the entire system by what's in your urine. And that is pretty cool. So the kidneys are pretty phenomenal. All right, so after we do filtration, or glomerular filtration, that's the only process that's occurring here in the glomerular capsule, So let's, or in the glomerular corpuscle. That's the only process that's happening here in the renal corpuscle. So let's just go ahead and write that down. This is where glomerular filtration occurs. <clears throat> okay. And then the filtrate is going to move into the second part of the nephron, the renal tubule. And the renal tubule has three parts, the proximal convoluted tubule, the nephron loop, and the distal convoluted tubule. 
So the nephron, the workhorse of the kidney, has two parts, a renal corpuscle and a renal tubule. The renal corpuscle has two parts, the renal tubule has three parts. So just be aware of that, you're going to need to know it. Luckily, I mean, glomerular filtration rate and controlling it is a little physiologically complex. We'll talk about that next time. But luckily, that's all that's going on there. Here, in the renal tubule, we've got two different processes going on. What's called tubular reabsorption and tubular secretion. And different processes are, or they can both be happening at different parts to, due to different ions and solutes and all of that. So it can kind of get complex. So just make sure you read over it between now and next class. And we'll go over the nitty gritty details next time. But when we leave our renal corpuscle then, we enter the renal tubule. And if we think about it, it's got three parts. What's called the proximal convoluted tubule, the nephron loop, and the distal convoluted tubule. Again, I'll just show you. This is from a fluid perspective. If our point of reference is where we're filtering blood, the glomerulus, and uh, the renal corpuscle here, then this is the proximal convoluted tubule. It's close to it from a fluid perspective. And the proximal convoluted tubule is longer and more windy. It has more microvilli on the cell surface of its cells. And that's because it's doing most of the adjustments to that filtrate to produce urine. Like 80% of the adjustments that we're doing are happening here in the proximal convoluted tubule. And then we enter the descending limb of the nephron loop turn this hairpin turn here and come up our ascending limb of the nephron loop into the distal convoluted tubule. The distal convoluted tubule is under hormonal control, so any secretion and absorption that's going on here is happening due to hormones. So when we've said anything in the past, like, oh, aldosterone stimulates sodium reabsorption at the kidney, that's right here at the distal convoluted tubule. And then that's going to lead away into these little collecting ductules that lead into our collecting ducts. And our collecting ducts are going to drain into these little papillary ducts. The whole time you're going down this collecting duct, you're reclaiming water. And you're sweeping it away in these capillaries we see here. And so we bring that water into the blood. And now we concentrate our urine as we're coming down here. And the whole time we're coming down here, we can reclaim water. So we're not technically urine yet. But as soon as we hit this papillary duct, we can't do anything else. So now it's urine, and then urine is going to collect in this um, medullary, the papilla of this medullary pyramid into this minor calyx. Our minor calyces merge to form major calyces. Our major calyces form, merge to form this renal pelvis, and then the renal pelvis leads urine away through the ureter. So those are the structures, and let's just kind of look at what's going on. Let me point something else out before I move back to the board. There, we're going to talk about two different types of nephrons, cortical nephrons and juxtamedullary nephrons. Juxtamedullary nephrons have these really long nephron loops that dip down into the medulla, and these are going to help to set up the osmotic pressure gradient that's going to allow for the most water reabsorption here in the collecting duct. So what's going to happen when we're coming down this tube is we're going to let some water out and sweep it away in those capillaries. Over here we're going to let some salt out and keep it stuck there so that we make a really salty interstitial fluid here. So that when we get all the way over here, we've got a really high osmotic pressure on water to move from this uh, urine to this salty interstitial fluid. Still gets picked up in these capillaries and swept away, but that's what's going to help us conserve water. It's great. And then it continues on its way. Okay. So, proximal convoluted tubule. For now, let's talk about the anatomy and I'll give you a little basic definition to think of physiology and we'll talk about the nitty gritty details of physiology next class. So the proximal convoluted tubule, I am always going to abbreviate as the PCT. And what we can say about it is that it's close to the glomerulus from a fluid perspective. We could say it's longer and more convoluted than the distal convoluted tubule. And 
will say that it makes most of the adjustments to the fluid that's passing through here. So like 80% of the secretion and reabsorption that are going to be done are occurring here in the proximal convoluted tubule. So we'll say it makes most of the adjustments to blood and urine. Okay, so we had up here an afferent arterial that was pretty wide in diameter that led into a glomerulus that led out to an efferent arterial. The difference in diameter that put a lot of pressure on that blood so that we could filter it using the passive transport process called filtration where you push a fluid against a semi-permeable membrane. So this Filtrate then is going to collect in this capsular space and move here into the proximal convoluted tubule. So we can just draw it out. Our proximal convoluted tubule is close, it's proximal from the fluid perspective to the glomerulus. And now it's going to lead down into the nephron loop. And what we see in the nephron loop is that we've got a descending limb and then an ascending limb, and that there are thick and thin regions of each. So we would see that we go from the proximal convoluted tubule into the thick walled nephron loop, uh, descending limb, and that's going to lead into the thin wall of the descending limb. And then we're going to go into this hairpin turn, and then we're going to go up the thin walled ascending limb into the thick walled ascending limb and then we're out of the nephron loop. So okay nephron loop. It's got a descending limb and an ascending limb. And again we're going to talk more about the nitty-gritty physiology next time but you're going to read about it in your book between now and then and you're going to see that in this descending limb what we're doing is we are pulling a bunch of water out of the fluid that is moving through this tubule system. So on this side we're going to do what's called reabsorption of water and this water is going to get swept away by the blood vessels. So that's going to be really important for setting up that osmotic pressure gradient. So for our descending limb right now we'll just say it reabsorbs water and it's impermeable to salt. We're going to round that hairpin turn and when we come around then start and start up our ascending limb, when we get to the thick wall, we'll see these, these um, salt pumps. And we're going to actively start pumping salt out to the interstitial fluid. So what that's going to do, and that's not going to get swept away in the blood. So we'll say up here what's going to happen is we're going to have reabsorption of salts, uh, sodium, chloride, potassium if we need it. Um, those salts are going to be pumped out here and they're going to get stuck in the interstitial fluid and that's going to create a really salty interstitial fluid that creates an osmotic pressure gradient. So in our ascending limb we'll say it's impermeable to water. There's not much in the body that's impermeable to water but the ascending limb is. It is permeable to salts. So what we'll do here is we have reabsorption of salts that is going to create this huge osmotic pressure gradient. So we'll say the reabsorption of salts creates the osmotic pressure gradient. For what? Let's put it in parentheses, the collecting duct. Not part of the nephron. Our nephron ends after the distal convoluted tubule. The distal convoluted tubule is going to lead into collecting tubules that are going to lead into the collecting duct. So next, our distal convoluted tubule. This is the part of the nephron that is under hormonal control. So this is under hormonal control. It's shorter and not as convoluted. The cells don't have as many microvilli. As the DT, uh, as the proximal convoluted tubule. Okay, so our distal convoluted tubule is under hormonal control. So anytime all year, we said this 
hormone targets the kidneys and causes it to do this. This hormone targets the kidneys and causes it to do this. This is the part of the kidneys <laughs> that that hormone was targeting. So back in first semester, we talked about bone um, and blood calcium homeostasis. Said that at the kidney, if we had excess calcium, one hormone could stimulate excretion of that calcium. If we had uh, low levels of calcium, another hormone could target the kidney and cause reabsorption of any calcium that may have been floating through. So which hormone causes calcium excretion? And which hormone causes calcium reabsorption? Okay, so calcitonin causes calcium excretion and parathyroid hormone causes calcium reabsorption. We'll talk more about that and write all that down later, but just be aware of that. And when I mean later, I mean next class. Okay, so that's the end of the nephron. So let me just draw up our distal convoluted tubule. It's going to be up here. It's going to be shorter, not as convoluted. It's under hormonal control. And then it's going to lead into these little collecting ductules that lead into the collecting duct. So one collecting duct is draining many nephrons. And one renal pyramid is draining many of those collecting ducts into that renal papilla. We're just going to go with this one. So the nephron ended here at the distal convoluted tubule. And now we're moving on into the collecting duct. So most everything that we're going to do to urine and blood has been done by the time we get to the collecting duct. But what we can do at the collecting duct is make some last, uh, last minute adjustments if we need to with water and then also with your acid base balance. So the maintaining a normal pH in blood is so important that two systems can act as buffers all on their own and your blood has buffers in it. So the respiratory system can act as a buffer and that's because of the effect of CO2 on blood um, pH and the urinary system can act as a buffer and that's because if you are too acidic or too basic the proximal convoluted tubule can do some but the collecting duct can also do some adjustment to the ion levels in your blood so let's say our blood vessels passing by here have um, too much hydrogen ion in it and my blood's too acidic then here at the collecting duct I can pull those hydrogen ions out and concentrate them in the forming urine. If I'm too basic I can pull bicarbonate ions out so um, and I can do that again the, the, the proximal convoluted tubule is doing a lot but the collecting duct can do a lot too because it's so important to maintain blood pH that the body's got uh, several ways to do so in place. So when we move away from the nephron into the collecting duct, there are two types of cells there. And if you're going to go into a detailed, like, uh, you know, career in kidneys and urology or something, you'll learn more about all of these cells later and exactly what they're doing. For now, we're just going to kind of have a general idea of what's going on get a good solid foundation of our understanding and move on. There's way too much going on in the kidneys to try and figure it all out on our own. So uh, in, a, in an intro level AMP class. So principal cells and intercalated cells are the two types of cells we find in the collecting duct. And the principal cells are going to be the cells that um, can alter sodium and water secretion and reabsorption here. And then the intercalated cells are going to be the cells that have an impact on pH balance. So these, uh, we'll say, can adjust blood pH. How? By retaining or excreting hydrogen ion primarily is what we're using to measure pH, but we can also, like, bicarbonate ion is going to help um, with pH, so all of that. We have two types of nephrons 
85% of your nephrons are what are called cortical nephrons. Anytime you have a majority of something, they're the most important. The most important job of your kidney is to filter your blood and keep it clean. If, you, if your kidneys fail and you cannot filter the waste out of your blood and keep your blood clean, you're dead in a matter of days. So kidneys cleaning your blood is their big important function. And how can they do that if there's nowhere to put all the waste? Where we put all the waste is in the urine. That is the big important job of the kidneys, which means that our cortical nephrons, which are 85% of our nephrons, are doing the big job of that. They're most responsible for urine formation. And we call them cortical nephrons because they're almost entirely found in the cortex. So they have either short or no nephron loops dipping down. So you can see these are our two types. Here's a juxtamedullary. Juxta means next to. This is next to the medulla. Here's a cortical. It's mostly contained in the cortex. It just has a little nephron loop that's dipping down. So be aware of that. We'll say that cortical nephrons are 85% of our nephrons. These are the most important for urine formation. Uh, so for blood filtration. which leads to urine formation. And what makes them cortical nephrons is that they are almost entirely located in the cortex. So they might not have a nephron loop. I mean, they, they have nephron loops, but it might not be dipping into the cortex at all. Or, sorry. It might not be dipping into the medulla at all, or it might just be dipping in a little. So we'll say they're nephron loops. either don't or barely dip into the medulla. And then our second type of nephron, I'm just gonna write its name right under here, is the juxtamedullary nephron. Juxta medullary, juxta next to medullary, next to the medulla. Our juxta medullary nephrons have long nephron loops that dip down, way down into the medulla. So they've got long nephron loops. Dipping into the medulla. So these are the ones that are going to be really important in setting that osmotic pressure gradient and therefore determining our water reabsorption. So these are going to be the ones that have the biggest impact on blood volume and blood pressure. So juxtamedullary nephrons, we'll say these set up our osmotic pressure gradient. These are the most important for blood pressure. Okay. All right. So that's our Nephron and our collecting ducts. Different types of nephrons we have. Now, what are these different types of capillaries that we find? Well, we've already talked about the glomerulus. What is it? It's a fenestrated tuft of capillaries in the renal corpuscle. So this is where we're gonna do filtration. The 
pressure on the blood in the glomerulus is higher than the pressure on the blood in these little arterioles. And that's because of the difference in diameter between the afferent and efferent arteriole. Since the afferent arteriole is higher in diameter, it creates a high pressure on here that's going to set what's called glomerular filtration rate. And so we're going to push against that fenestrated tuft of capillaries to form our filtrate that's going to determine the rate of our urine formation. So glomerulus is really super important. This a little tuft of capillaries there. And when we leave the glomerulus through this efferent arteriole, now we're going to enter the capillary beds that are going to serve the kidney tissue. So we've got two different types. The peritubular capillaries are the capillaries that we see surrounding the renal tubule of all of our nephrons up there in the renal cortex. So if we look here, Peri means around and tubulars are like around the tubule. All of these are our peritubular capillaries running around here. All of these are vasa recta and the blood flowing through them is flowing in an opposite direction of the, as the fluid flowing through these nephron loops. So if the fluid coming through this nephron loop is going this way, then the vasa recta blood is going this way. So um, yeah, that's going to be important for setting up these things called the countercurrent multiplier and the countercurrent exchange system that we'll just talk a little bit about next time. Okay, but once we leave that efferent arterial, then we're going to enter one of those two types of capillary beds to serve the tissue. So our peritubular capillaries are the capillaries surrounding the tubule system and the renal cortex. And then those other really long ones surrounding those juxtamedullary nephron loops are the vasa recta. And these are going to sweep away that water so that we can concentrate those salts in that interstitial fluid. So vasa recta are going to work with these juxtamedullary nephron loops to help set up that osmotic pressure gradient. So vasa recta, we'll say these surround our juxtamedullary nephron loops in the medulla. They're in the medulla and help set up the osmotic pressure gradient by sweeping the water away, or I'll say by returning water to the blood. Okay, so vasa recta. They surround juxtamedullary nephron loops. They're in the medulla and they help set up the osmotic pressure gradient by returning water to the blood instead of letting it collect there in the interstitial fluid. So peritubular capillaries we would find surrounding all up here. Vasa recta we would find down here and where the water comes out on this side it gets collected and swept away in the vasa recta and where the sodium collects on this side it doesn't, the salts get just concentrated here in the interstitial fluid so that we get really salty out here. So when we pass back through in the collecting duct, we've got this really high osmotic pressure gradient. It's beautiful. Okay. So the last part of anatomy that we're going to talk about is this thing called the juxtaglomerular complex or the juxtaglomerular apparatus, JGA, JGC. It's all the juxtaglomerular thing. The juxtaglomerular complex. So juxta, we said meant next to. The glomerulus. This is what actually happens in the body with the distal convoluted tubule. I said that it's distal from a fluid perspective. From an actual physical perspective, it's right up against the glomerulus and it's going to be able to respond to what's going on in our filtrate and do some stuff. So if we look right here, this is our glomerulus and the proximal convoluted tubule. This right here is the distal convoluted tubule. So distal convoluted tubules wrap around and touch against afferent arterioles. This creates this 
juxtaglomerular complex. Next to the glomerulus, I've got this complex. And so what it's going to be able to do is talk to the smooth muscle cells here in the afferent arterial and adjust the constriction or dilation of the afferent arterial so that we can keep glomerular filtration rate constant despite what's going on in the body. And how it's gonna do that is these cells here are, well, there are a couple different ways, but these cells here in the distal convoluted tubule are paying attention to how much sodium chloride is passing through in this urine. And if there's a lot, well then we're going too fast. So we need to slow, adjust, slow the rate of urine formation and we can like do this communication through here. It's like a little telephone message, tell these guys, and then they adjust glomerular filtration rate. So we'll talk more about that next class, but that's what we're talking about right now. So, and if we pro that's probably, yes, that's what we've got going on here. So if we look here, um, we've got our renal corpuscle here, and it's gonna lead away into the proximal convoluted tubule in light green, that leads away into the nephron loop, then we come back up around and our distal convoluted tubule is gonna come back around and wrap around and touch this afferent arterial. So the, the important cell types that we have that are part of the juxtaglomerular complex are these cells in here in the afferent arterial called granular cells or juxtaglomerular cells or JG cells? And then the important cells that are gonna be involved over here are called macula densa. So that's what we can see here. I'll write all that stuff down now. <laughs> and this model isn't showing us these other ones that are middlemen in the game of telephone that happens here, but there is a third cell type there as well. First, let's say our macula densa, these are in the distal convoluted tubule. Well, what drives me kind of crazy about different books is that different books put them in different places. So some books say that these macula densa cells are in the like last portion of the ascending nephron loop. Uh, other books say that they're right here in this first person portion of the distal convoluted tubule. I'm going to call them macula densa cells. I'm going to say they're in the distal convoluted tubule. These are chemoreceptors for sodium chloride because they're, so they're sensitive to the amount of sodium chloride passing through the filtrate because if there's too much, if we're not bringing back enough sodium, we're not gonna bring back enough water. Sodiums are most important for osmotic pressure. So if, if there's a lot of sodium through there, then it's indicating that we're doing too much glomerular filtration. So these cells can tell these cells who will then constrict and slow glomerular filtration right here so that I can reabsorb sodium through there. So that's kind of what they're doing. Our granular cells, these are also called juxtaglomerular cells or JG cells. These cells are sensitive to level of stretch in this afferent arterial, so they act as barrel receptors, and they're going to be able to do a couple things. They're the cells that release renin, but they're also able to do what's called um, renal autoregulation, and they can adjust the constriction or dilation of the afferent arterial right here to keep the glomerular filtration rate constant. So our granular cells, these are mechanoreceptors. They're detecting level of stretch. So they're detecting um, blood pressure. So level of stretch, which is indicative of blood pressure. And they are gonna be able to do a couple things. They can stimulate constriction. Well, I'll say they can st stimulate vasomotion in the afferent arterial. And these are also the cells that release renin. Okay. The third cell type that we find in that juxtaglomerular complex are these middlemen between the macula densa cells and the uh, um, granular cells. So if the granular cells were right here in the wall of the afferent arterial and our distal convoluted tubule actually in the body is wrapping back around and touching up against it, then my macula densa cells are right here, my granular cells are right here, 
And then in between them, I've got these other cells that play like middlemen, these extra glomerular mesangial cells. Some books just call them mesangial cells. They're sending a message from the macula densa to the granular cells telling them what these guys discovered. So the macula densa are paying attention to how much sodium chloride is going through in the filtrate and they're telling the mesangial cells who are telling the granular cells that can then adjust glomerular filtration rate by causing vasomotion in the afferent arterial. Again, we'll go over this more next time, but we're just kind of putting this all in our pocket for now. So these are the middlemen between my macula densa and my, my JG cells. So, you know, back in the day, like elementary, you played telephone and you whispered pss, 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 in your neighbor's ear. And then they whispered in their neighbor's ear. And by the time you got back around, like it was all different and all the words got changed. And you know, some class clown was doing it on purpose. But these guys are like the middlemen. So like they, like the macula densa cells tell the extra glomerular mesangial cells, hey, there's not enough sodium chloride. You need to increase filtration rate. So then if there's not enough sodium chloride, then it's going to be opposite of when there's too much sodium chloride. And we'll go through all that next time. And then the, uh, these cells will tell the granular cells and they'll adjust afferent arterial diameter. I think that's all I want to talk about today. Okay. So that's the end of anatomy. But before we leave, let's just go over the physiological processes, the definition of them, kind of put it in our back pocket. And because this is where the kidneys get confusing. So this is where the physiology can feel painful. And so this is where we'll pick up next time. But let's just look, the physiology of the kidneys. We have three processes that are involved. Glomerular filtration, we said, was the passive filtration of blood that occurred here in the renal corpuscle as we push this blood against that filtration membrane. Then when we move into the renal tubule, we're gonna be doing these other two processes, tubular reabsorption and tubular secretion. And that's what's going to be making the adjustments to blood and urine. So glomerular filtration. This is a passive process that occurs only in the glomerulus. And what makes it passive? Well, I'm just passively pushing on a semi-permeable membrane. So it's hydrous filtration is a fluid pushing on a semi-permeable membrane. And it's passive because no ATP is required. So I just squish. I just have hydrostatic pressure and the pressure pushes, pushes out. So we could say that it's um, what we're doing is we're pushing blood on our filtration membrane. We'll talk more about that next time. And then when we enter the proximal convoluted tubule, we're immediately going to be doing both of our other processes. Tubular reabsorption of some things, tubular secretion of some things. So these processes are occurring throughout the renal tubule and they are active or passive processes depending on what you're talking about. So these are throughout the renal tubule and it's both active and tra uh, passive transport processes of various materials. And we will talk about them uh, next time. But the two processes are tubular reabsorption and tubular secretion. Now, why do we call it tubular reabsorption? Well, the first time I absorbed it was in my small intestine. And then it went to my liver and got filtered and then it entered my blood. And then my blood came to my kidneys and just a moment ago at my glomerulus, I filtered it out. I filtered all this stuff out. And so if there's anything in all that stuff that got filtered out that I want back, I have to reabsorb it. 
because we just pushed it out, but now I want it back. So reabsorption is going to bring back useful and necessary molecules that got pushed out. So tubular reabsorption brings back everything we want. So nutrients, glucose, amino acids, uh, vitamins and minerals down their concentration gradient. So as we said, one of the functions of the kidneys was to regulate ion balance. So it's going to be paying attention to, oh, you took 5,000 milligrams of vitamin C today? Then I'm going to secrete a bunch of that. Oh, you have no vitamin C? Then I'm gonna reabsorb whatever might be going through. So the kidneys are really paying attention to the composition of your blood to determine what we're doing with each of these other processes. Okay, so tubular reabsorption is gonna bring back all we want. And then tubular secretion. This is a really weird way to use the word secretion because every time we've used the word secretion before, we've been talking about some product that's being secreted either into a duct or into the blood. But what's happening now in tubular secretion is we are pulling everything out of the blood that we don't want and we're secreting it in the fluid that's gonna become urine so that it gets concentrated there. So this can really throw people off with, with with um, cleverly worded questions. So just remember that secretion leads to excretion. Tubular secretion leads to excretion. We're gonna pull it out of the blood, concentrate it in the urine, and excrete it out of the system. So tubular secretion is going to pull, we'll say it pulls wastes and unneeded or unwanted materials out of your blood and concentrates it in the fluid that's becoming urine. So tubular secretion leads to excretion. Tubular reabsorption and tubular secretion are happening through the proximal convoluted tubule. We have tubular reabsorption of water in the descending nephron loop. We have tubular reabsorption of salts in the ascending nephron loop. We have some secretion of urea. Uh, we're not going to worry about that in this class. Uh, but there is some secretion that occurs in the nephron loop. And then when we get to the distal convoluted tubule, our tubular, re tubular reabsorption and tubular secretion are going to be under hormonal control. Then we're going to get to the collecting duct, which is not part of the nephron, and it can respond to some hormones and do some, it's going to do a lot of tubular reabsorption of water as we pass back through that salty interstitial fluid. And then if we need to make adjustments to blood pH, then we could do that through tubular secretion there if necessary. So review all of that in your book. That's our discussion of the urinary system for today. I will see you next time. Oh, that's not right. They're interlobar.